Good afternoon. I'd like to take this time and look at a few of the items that you're going to see on the Unit 3 exam. Again, please make sure that you have read through chapters 27 through 31 because as I'm sure you know by now, some of those questions can be a little bit more specific. So this is the second part of the review and we are going to cover everything from the Gulf of Tonkin resolution to Sandra Day O'Connor. So let's go ahead and get started. So we're going to start with the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution. The Gulf of Tonkin Resolution was passed by Congress on August 7th, 1964. The Gulf of Tonkin Resolution was essentially the equivalent to a declaration of war for the Lyndon B. Johnson administration. President Johnson would use the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution to escalate America's involvement in the Vietnam War. So for example, during the John F. Kennedy administration, there was approximately 17,000 American soldiers fighting in Vietnam. By the end of the Johnson administration, there was a little bit over half a million American soldiers fighting in Vietnam. As America's presence in the Vietnam War continued to escalate, the younger generations of America began to dodge a very unpopular draft and protest America's involvement in the war itself. The presidential election of 1968. Even though Richard Nixon had publicly and personally stated that he would bring an end to his political career after the loss of the gubernatorial race of California, in 1962, Nixon decided to run for the presidency in 1968 with the support of what he referred to as the silent majority, which were people who wanted the United States to come out of the Vietnam War, but on U.S. terms, not necessarily the North Vietnamese terms. They were also against dodging the draft and they were against the protest that protest against the war that had taken place um, throughout the Johnson administration. Nixon would win the election with 301 electoral votes compared to the 191 electoral votes that were gathered by Hubert Humphrey, the Democrat candidate in the presidential race. For the time, it was completely unheard of for a politician to lose a federal race, such as the presidential election of 1960, to then go on and lose a state race, like the gubernatorial race of California in 1962, and somehow come back to win a federal race again in 1968. You simply did not see that. You did not see a politician lose a federal race lose a state race, and then somehow come back up and win a federal race. But as it turns out, Richard Nixon was the exception. Now we're going to talk about Betty Friedan's publication of The Feminine Mystique. On February 19, 1963, Betty Friedan published a book that would encourage the rise of the second wave of the feminist movement. It would be known as The Feminine Mystique. She would later become a co-founder of NOW, the National Organization for Women, and a strong supporter of the ratification of the ERA, the Equal Rights Amendment. In her book, Ferdinand argued that women should be able to have it all. Women should be able to have a college degree, should be able to have a happy and successful career, and at the same time, raise a family. Now we're going to look at the bombing raid of Cambodia and the Kent State shooting. As Richard Nixon was running for the presidency in 1968, he appealed to many, especially a group known as the Silent Majority, in which we just defined, because he pledged to de-escalate America's involvement in the Vietnam War in a way that would be favorable for the United States. 
Although President Nixon would slowly reduce the number of U.S. soldiers in Vietnam, as you can recall, uh, you know, during the Johnson administration, there was over half a million U.S. soldiers in Vietnam. Nixon not only being able to de-escalate the number of soldiers in Vietnam, but yet at the same time, he escalated America's involvement in the war and also expanded the war itself whenever he decided to launch what he referred to as Operation Menu, which was a bombing raid on Eastern Cambodia. Operation Menu or America's bombing raid on Cambodia would take place from March 18, 1969 to May 26, 1970. Nixon aimed to bomb various areas of eastern Cambodia, which he argued were providing armies of North Vietnam with resources and supplies in order to continue fighting against American forces. Historians argue that Nixon's decision to bomb Cambodia represents one of the most controversial decisions of his presidency and of world history. On May 4, 1970, four college students who were enrolled at Kent State University were killed and nine other students were injured when the Ohio National Guard opened fire on the college students as they were protesting against the Nixon against Nixon's decision to bomb Cambodia and Nixon's decisions in regards to the Vietnam War as a whole. Nixon launched another bombing raid upon eastern Cambodia beginning on May 19, 1970 that would last all the way until August 15, 1973. This raid is referred to as Operation Freedom Deal. And because of Nixon's controversial decisions, Operation Menu and Operation Freedom New Deal, excuse me, Operation Freedom Deal, Congress would later pass what was known as the War Powers Resolution. The United States would finally withdraw from the Vietnam War on August 15, 1973 approximately two years after American forces were pulled out of Vietnam, the capital of South Vietnam, Saigon, fell to North Vietnam and the spread of communism. The Vietnam War was responsible for the loss of over 1,353,000 casualties, both military and civilian, and the United States suffered the loss of over 282,000 casualties. The Watergate scandal. On June 17, 1972, a group of burglars were arrested while attempting to break into the National Democratic Headquarters at the Watergate Hotel in Washington, D.C. After they were arrested, it soon was revealed that one of the burglars, James McCord, was a member of CREEP, the committee to re-elect the president. Once the press became aware of this fact, two reporters from the Washington Post, Carl Bernstein and Bob Woodward, became convinced that there was a direct connection between the burglary of Richard M. Nixon. Regarding the presidential election of 1972, historians have a hard time wrapping their mind around Nixon's decision to first commit a crime and cover up a crime to ensure a second term because being an experienced politician, Nixon should have known that it would have been impossible for him to lose the presidential election of 1972. However, it appears that that was not the case. Although Nixon would be reelected in November of 1972 against the Democratic candidate George McGovern, a Senate investigation would be launched in early of 1973. John Dean, Nixon's former White House counsel, would testify that Nixon had played a direct role in orchestrating the crime, covering up the White House's involvement in the crime, and had actually recorded conversations from the Oval Office. After Dean's testimony, and after learning about the possible recordings, the Senate was convinced that Richard Nixon had and was involved in one way or another.
The question was asked, what did the question, uh, excuse me, what did the president know and when did he know it? Congress then demanded that Richard Nixon hand the tapes over for review. Their request was denied by Nixon as he argued that the tapes and the conversations in which they recorded were protected as part of executive privilege. As a result of Nixon's refusal, the House of Representatives soon decided to impeach Richard Nixon in July of 1974. Before the Senate could remove Nixon from office, he resigned on August 9, 1974. It is important to remember that it was not the Democratic Party uh, that had control of the House of Representatives that forced Nixon to resign, but it was Nixon's own party, the Senate, who had a control of the Senate itself uh, that eventually forced Nixon to resign. They basically just could not support him any longer. The Watergate scandal would be responsible for the conviction of many within the Nixon administration. In an effort to get the country past the Watergate scandal, President Ford decided to pardon Nixon for his crimes against the United States. As you can imagine, uh, that decision would destroy Ford's political reputation. Because to many Americans, it would seem as though Ford had pardoned the person who was responsible for committing the greatest political crime against the United States in the 20th century. After the Watergate scandal, Americans would lose a significant amount of confidence within the federal government, especially within the presidency itself. Nixon taught the country a difficult lesson that just because one is elected president does not mean that one is of impeccable character. It does not mean that one holds high morals. It does not mean that one is incapable of committing a crime against the country that one has sworn to protect. Cesar Chavez. In 1962, Cesar Chavez founded the National Farm Workers Association, and due to his efforts, the state of California would pass the California Agricultural Labor Relations Act in 1975. This act assured, ensured, excuse me, ensured justice, peace, and stability regarding labor relations. It also ensured the right of association, organization, and legal representation in an effort to provide a secure labor equality. The Stonewall Uprising. The Stonewall Uprising took place between June 28th and July 3rd of 1969 in Greenwich Village in New York City. The Stonewall Uprising played a significant role in leading to social, political, educational, and economic equality for the LGBTQ community. Today, celebrations are held all around the world to show appreciation for the dedication and courage of the people who fought for equality in the Stonewall Uprising of 1969. Reaganomics. Reaganomics is defined as the federal government's policies in regards to the economy during the Ronald Reagan administration. Two noted characteristics of Reaganomics is a reduction of taxes and a hands-off or unrestricted stock market. Sandra Day O'Connor. Sandra Day O'Connor served as a U.S. Supreme Court judge from September 25, 1981 to January 31, 2006. As a moderate Republican, she normally ruled along with a conservative bloc. O'Connor was the first woman to serve as a U.S. Supreme Court judge, and she received the Medal of Honor on August 12, 2009. So I hope this has provided you with some more information. Uh, make sure again that you have read chapters 27 through 31 because those questions can get a little bit more specific. 
I always wish y'all the best of luck on the exams and I will see y'all soon. Have a good day. Bye.